Good evening and welcome to this Art UK Unlocked David Livingston Centre talk. My name is Catherine Simpson and I'm going to talk to you a little about both uh, the David Livingston Centre itself and some of the gorgeous items we have in our collection. Now, the Livingston Centre is a unique building. It is the building that Livingston 19th century missionary, traveller and doctor was born in and where his family lived while working for the Henry Monteith Cotton Spinning Works in the 1800s. In uh, 1904, the firm went into liquidation and the building fell into dis disrepair. It was actually condemned in 1913, but due to an ongoing housing crisis and the war, it was actually not knocked down, thankfully for us, because in 1925, when the first idea for a memorial to David Livingston was thought about, the building was almost derelict, but still standing. Interestingly, bar the one room that Livingston's family had lived in, which was maintained by an old woman who charged a small amount to visitors and kept a record of those visitors in a logbook, which we still have in the museum to this day. But apart from that one room, the entire building was a slum. After the creation of a committee to save the building and begin to plan a memorial, it was assumed that the great and good of Scotland would uh, be happy to donate to the creation of a memorial to Scotland's great son. It was also assumed that people in North America and in South Africa would also be happy to contribute. With the likes of J.M. Barry, John Buckham, Earl Haig, J. Ramsey MacDonald, among many others, being supporters of the idea of having a memorial, it seemed like a sure thing that they would get the money. But they received few funds. And then after that didn't work, they planned to launch an appeal to raise money. But unfortunately, that coincided with the start of the general strike in May 1926. So they had to postpone trying to raise money until the autumn. And in fact, by the end of 1926, less than a quarter of the intended money to look after the museum had been raised. But this, weirdly enough, is where our story starts and is what was the making of one of the most unique people-centred cultural heritage spaces in 20th century Scotland? Because they came up with a new idea. They approached over, over a thousand, I still can't believe this, over a thousand Sunday schools and Bible classes for donations across Scotland, and the literal pennies rolled in. They also had flag days in the main Scottish towns to gather donations from folk, and uh, ultimately nine-tenths of the money made was uh, raised in Scotland by ordinary people and uniquely children to which extent there is actually a plaque on the wall of our museum, which you can see in the center of the picture in front of you to this day that commemorates all the children that were part of making the museum. The committee had initially actually wanted the great polymath Patrick Geddes, the Scot whose ideas about town planning and civic life were famously forged during his time in Edinburgh to design the memorial, but Geddes was in France, so someone recommended his son-in-law Frank Mears instead. Mears also subscribed to the ethos of sustainable environment and open spaces and importantly, simplicity of design. It was he who ensured that we have a vast expanse of land open for people to play on and generally enjoy that surrounds the museum to this day. And interestingly, it was Mears who came up with the idea of traveling from room to room in a museum or art gallery to follow the life of a story. We now find such a design ubiquitous across cultural heritage sites, but back then it was a brilliant original idea. Obviously the focus for the memorial initially and why we are still based in Blantyre was the 10 foot by 14 foot birth room, the room in which Livingston's family lived and he was born. But we are also full of many and varied beautiful objects and artworks. And again, what's interesting is that many of these objects came from people in the area surrounding the museum. And often people donated precious family relics or or works of art that they would have actually made more money from than by selling it than had they given it to us at the museum. Such an origin story reminds us constantly to be aware of the lived experience of the real people that make up the stories in the museum, the influence they have on what we see, how we see it, and the huge value of each and every encounter in every object, story, and artwork we hold. So what of Livingston himself? As a mid 19th century British traveler, Livingston was inseparable from the colonial circumstances of his geography and the time that he lived. As essentially the first European curator of the representation of his encounters with people, he fashioned narratives and gathered objects which became British artifacts and supported his own narrative. 
My aim in the rest of this talk is to look at the complexities or hidden and unaccounted for stories in the objects we hold in the museum and the problems that we encounter in, in finding those stories that represent Livingston, his family, the people of Scotland and the wider world. I also want to start by stating my perspective. I do not wish to take up the limited female museal space that is often not mine to occupy. Instead, I endeavour through my research and through talks like this to renegotiate and advance the critical practices that we engage with in cultural heritage institutions. My aim is also to take responsibility for returning to people the narratives of artefacts taken by my ancestors, held in galleries and museums in my countries and collected to bolster my nation's imperial history and ultimately to facilitate this telling of stories of our shared cultural legacies and histories. So first to one of the loudest absences um, in Livingston's story, his wife. This plate was received from Mrs. Joan Tovey in 1935 with the wonderful providential link from Mrs. Tovey of it being, quote, from her half aunt by marriage's mother's aunt. Can't tell you how long we spent trying to work out actually what the connections were with that one. The old label for this saucer reads that it's one of Mary's few luxuries, including this china cup and saucer. The cup and saucer had come via Anne Staler, who with her sisters kept an open house for missionaries in Cape Town in South Africa. The Livingstons had actually presented the tea set to them and then Annie bequeathed the cups to uh, Joan Toby's sister, who then bequeathed them to us. Mary was the eldest of nine children born to Scottish missionaries. She grew up in a station in Kuruman, South Africa, where she was encouraged to be incredibly independent from a young age, traveling hundreds of miles alone to school in Cape Town. She was 23 and training to be a teacher when she met Livingston at the Moffat Missionary Museum in South Africa, where he, a 31-year-old medical missionary, was recovering after being bitten by a lion. A famous, if not now infamous, story depicted in our Harry Housen designed statue, which is in the grounds of the museum, which you can see to this day. Born in Guigratsad, a town now in Northern Cape province in South Africa, Mary gained fluency in multiple languages, including Tswana. Her linguistic fluency and the widespread reputation of her father as being someone of honesty and integrity aided Livingston as he traveled as she was able to discourse with people and groups they encountered and facilitate access to important people whose lands they traveled through, such as Sebetuane, chief of the Patna in present day Zambia, particularly in the early years of David's career. And in fact, as influential as his wife was Agnes David's, David and Mary's second son, second child, sorry, first daughter. She also contributed to David's reputation, working with, among others, James Tuma and Abdullah Susi, the men who transported his body to Tanzania after he died. She worked with them at Newstead Abbey in Nottinghamshire to realize her father's posthumous last book. Agnes went on to found the Scottish Geographical Society with John George Bartholomew of the famous map making family on the 21st of July, 1884. They actually allowed women to join eight years before the Royal Geographical Society did down in England. But I find this saucer a particularly poetic object. It is beautiful and delicate and refined, but yet we so, know so little about the hard and difficult lived experience of the woman who originally owned it. A woman who, due to the societal biases of the time, it could well also be argued suffered more in Britain than she ever did in the countries of Southern Africa. This comb was collected by Charles Meller on David's Zambezi expedition. Uh, our information states that this is a wooden comb with a carved design and that Livingston was given this comb by the wife of an African chief. The name of the woman it once belonged to is not recorded, although it is believed she was part of a community local to the Zambezi River in eastern Africa. Charles Meller was actually the surgeon naturalist of the second Zambezi expedition, which was 1858 to 1864. Um, he, first in post was the famous John Kirk, who went on to be governor administrator in Zanzibar. On this expedition, a group of 12 men from Sierra Leone and Liberia, as well as the six men from Britain, started out with Livingston. At various stages of the expedition, men from the Kololo people originating in Southern Africa, a group of male slaves from Sena in Northwestern Mozambique, Johanna men from Sofala Providence, province in uh, Mozambique also supported or were part of the expedition. 
There are no mention of women made in the party's journals and in the official published accounts. The same sources, though, do show that the groups frequently interacted with women, but we just don't know their names, as with this object. In fact, Dave, uh, David's wife, Mary, and their son, Oswald, who was seven years old in 1856, had also been part of the original group of travellers. However, when the group arrived in Cape Town on South, in South Africa, Mary found she was pregnant, so she separated from the group and went to her parents' house, Robert and Mary Moffat, uh, to give birth to her sixth and final child, Anna Mary. By the time the British government had actually recalled this particular expedition at the end of 1863, of the original party, three of the men, had, three of the British men, had been dismissed from the group for poor behaviour. Richard Thornton, one of the British men in the group, as well as Mary, had died. All of the crew men had been dismissed for their efforts to secure better conditions for themselves. And in the end, the expedition, or rather Livingston himself, had been blamed by the British media for the death of five other Britons, three of whom were children, who had established a mission station in Magomero in present-day southern Malawi. So, Malawi having been inspired and supported by Livingston to set up the mission. The expedition rooted in European imperial prerogatives of Christianity, commerce and civilization was traumatic and traumatizing for the many people involved in it. There are limited written accounts providing details about African experiences of the expedition and what is available is fragmentary across multiple sources and with varying degrees of accuracy. But from the little that is written, it is evident that the expedition did not result in kinder outcomes for the many African individuals involved. So what value is this comb to us? Well, it is a thing of beauty, most obviously. It is hard wearing, but delicate with a gorgeous pattern engraved across it. A belonging used, possibly worn and definitely cherished, particularly if we are to assume, as the comb is stated as a gift, that gifts usually have some value or significance to both the giver and receiver. We know so little about this comb. We do know specific comb styles were used by specific ethnic groups. But this comb embodies centuries of history and significance. As Opeyemi Ademolo notes, the African comb is a microcosm of the greater need for Africans to tell their stories. The woman behind the comb has, for us, an archival memorial weightlessness, meaning she exists more as a phantom behind the comb, with her being an agency largely occluded from the records that we have. Yet she is still detectable enough to identify her as an individual in the world and recognize her connection to a particular geographic location. Such women whose belongings have often ornamentalized, idealized imperial narratives are almost lost to us. They are ancestors in the objects histories that we hold and separate or separated from how we present or explain the objects in our collection. The comb is one of many items in our collection that we are researching to understand those stories and resituate them as belongings that explicitly have real people behind them. If you're interested in knowing more about combs, I highly recommend the Fitzwilliam Museum has done a lot of work on this type of comb and their digital online uh, website has more information of this particular kind of belonging. These horn marriage cuffs are also another interesting example of something that we know little of. We know that we acquired them at the museum in November 1988, but we know little of the story behind them. Marriage cuffs or bracelets speak to a wealth of personal and community relationships, but how do we tell their story? We might have no way of knowing the original creator, wearer or owner, but we can understand how they would have held the arms, how being made of horn means that after a while they would have warmed up to body temperature, becoming part of the person wearing them. Whilst we cannot yet connect any women's names or stories to these bracelets, we have learned that not all women are absent from or mute from the accounts of Livingston's travels or in the objects that we hold. Some representations of women have always been there, but they've somehow remained unseen. This tree under which Livingston's heart was buried when he died um, was cut down in May 1899. This particular section somehow made its way to the museum and the section that had uh, Livingston's death date and name on it was I went to the Royal Geographical Society and it's still on display in their premises to this day. I chose this tree slice not because it's particularly beautiful, but because it's a reminder of the many people who helped Livingston on his journeys. 
As I just mentioned, people who have been, as with the items above, slightly disappeared from our narrative, but they are still there. In particular, I think of Halima, who was the cook for Livingston during the second half of his travels. She was possibly an enslaved person. We do know that Livingston bought her and we are fairly certain he manumitted her straight away. She was a servant to the groups that he traveled, uh, traveled with and she was the cook for Livingston, particularly when he was beginning to lose his teeth when he was severely ill. Halima always ensured that she had a special kind of brain that enabled Livingston to be able to continue to eat. He called her the best spoke in his wheel and paid her the same as the men in his party. In fact, she was also one of the many people who accompanied his body back to the coast before it was returned to the UK. April of this year is actually the 150th anniversary of his funeral at Westminster Abbey. We are holding um, a conference at the museum to talk about the stories of people like these on the 150th anniversary of that funeral. Livingston, as I've said, was aided and abetted by many people. Only two of these people, Susie and Chuma, have been memorialized in historical chronicles in any substantial manner. It raises the question of why other members of the party have not been recognized in such a similar manner. And it could be suggested that their stories have been lost because they did not travel to Britain. The Royal Geographical Society names James Chuma and Abdullah Susi Britain's first black geographers. Although I say they have been memorialized, in fact, we know very little of them. We have beautiful images that we hold in the museum of both of these men that are clearly um, stylized images that have been taken in portrait studios. But at least they give us a tangible engagement with the people behind some of the objects we hold in our collection. And I will have to say, thanks to a fabulous work of our volunteers and staff, James Truma and Abdul Susi have a much richer Wikipedia page than they did a couple of years ago. Susi originally worked on the Zambezi at Shupanga as a riverman. Livingston referred to, referred to him as a Shupanga man. He was a canny leader and he was adept at long distance travel organizations. As we know in the work that he did to arrange the transportation of Livingston's body back to the coast before it was brought back to the UK. Chuma is, is, is particularly interesting. He was about 10 years younger than Susi. We know Chuma's father's name was Chimalengo, who was a proficient fisherman, and his mum was Chinjerapai. I apologize if I've said that incorrectly. While still only a boy, he was actually sold for two bunches of fish to a Portuguese slaver. Livingston had always understood it to be that Chuma had been sold by his own Yao people, but uh, Chuma believed that he had been caught and sold by other people, the Manjanga tribe, uh, the Manjanga ethnic group. And he disputes that uh, he was actually sold by his own relatives. This is an interesting detail to know because later on when Chuma started to make money in expeditionary travel and in supporting people like Livingston, his family came asking for money, which he was happy to give them, whereas Livingston disagreed with Chuma giving his wages to his family because he thought they were the ones that had sold Chuma to the Portuguese slavers. We're really very lucky in the museum to hold something that we know belonged to either both Chuma and Susi or one or other of them. We received this double-handled urn from Reverend Archibald Smith in Malangi, Malawi at some point before 1984. Much of the existing information about this fiber urn has been previously lost. And prior to the excellent research that the staff and volunteers at the museum did, all we knew that it was that it belonged to one of these men men who had worked with Livingston, who had been part of his travels and who had assisted him so much. Um, the urn had been sent to a specialist lab to get the fibers tested and find out more. It was likely made of wood or cane, which is why it's quite a sturdy structure and still looks like this to this day. The body is also made of natural materials. Um, the fibers were sent for testing. Um, with the theory that the fibres might be coconut, but it has been disproved. So as yet, the identity of the plant is still unconfirmed. The bindings um, are particularly sturdy on the urn. And as with the bracelets, what I particularly love about this urn is the way that the rope goes round the two handles. 
is such that you want to hold it. You can see how it is a practical yet beautiful object, and you can understand how nice it would be to hold. Your fingers betwi fitting between the rope spaces on the handles to give you a good firm grip. If you want to know more about uh, the double handled urn, we do have lots of details um, next to the item on a touch screen in the museum, which also includes the report from when the urn was sent to the lab to find out more information about it. One of the successes we have in the museum for finding out information about the items we hold in our collection has been this lip ring. Throughout the 19th century, European travelers to the African continent and elsewhere often returned home and published about their experiences. They wrote narratives that supported their socio-cultural beliefs and they corroborated their stories with geographically and ethnically coded objects that they had acquired on their travels. For Livingston's case, many of these subsequently made their way into our museum. Livingston was one of the most well-known principally because his three books had been so successful. Missionary Travels in 1857, which was considered and is still considered one of the best-selling travel books of the age. Narratives of Zambezi Expedition in 1865 and the posthumous Last Journals of David Livingston in 1874. These books had a profound impact on how people in Anglophone nations understood people and cultures from Southern and Central Africa. Livingston had brought back a wealth of objects or sent back a wealth of objects to this country, including items that had belonged to people he had met and that he had purchased or acquired. Many of the objects, though we now acknowledge them for their beauty and exquisite craftsmanship, he brought back to support imperial ideas around difference and otherness. An extract from Livingston's diary, written in April 18. 59 in the Shar River Valley, home to many Manjanga communities, talks about the jewellery people wore in the region. This attentiveness, which you see, which is evident across the many drawings and writings in his journal, shows Livingston's particular focus on women and their belongings from an overwhelmingly ethnographic perspective. He writes, the women perforate the upper lip close to the nose and enlarge the orifice until they can insert a ring of ivory or tin of from which one to two inches in diameter. Some ladies of fashion have the upper, drip so, upper lip so drawn out as to admit the outer edge of the lip hangs below the chin and the mouth and the under lip appears through the upper. Livingston did not only write about lip rings, he also acquired them, as you can see on the screen. Matanga et al. assert, quote, the naming of objects which mostly acknowledge a tribe or region denied and erased the local authorship and ownership of the original owners, users, or custodians of objects." End quote. Identification of this particular lip ring is only that it is a Manjanga's lady's lip ring. It similarly acknowledges a group while denying and erasing individual agency. Sitting on display in the museum, the lip ring is separated from its original context and points to a colonial understanding as an artifact in someone else's story. It has a unique identifier, which is assigned as an item of jewellery, an object in a museum collection that seems innocuous. But fundamentally, the letters and numbers on the unique ID and the writing on the lip ring serve as markers of the object's home in a museum collection and as dehumanising even violent evidence of a lack of acknowledgement that the jewellery once belonged to a specific person. While I may not be able to uncover the person, Manjanga, lady behind the lip ring or anyone else involved in the object's making, ownership or use of, we have been able to find out that the object is likely the one that Livingston mentions in a letter written to his daughter Agnes, who he called Nanny, on the 28th of February 1860 when he was at the edge of the Congon, which is a distributary of the Zambezi. My dear Nanny, I send this home by Mr Ray, whom probably you may see. I send at the same time a box with a few things of few objects of natural history for Robert and Thomas and a few rings for you. One is a lip ring and if you wear it like the women up the shower do, Mr Ray will show you how. I bought it and the woman took it out of a hole in her lip and gave it. Very sorry, I thought, to part with a thing that made her so braw. Braw being a Scottish word for beautiful or fine. But Livingston thought he was very sorry to part with the item points to his awareness that the original owner particularly did not maybe want to give up her personal jewellery. 
An argument made more strongly when you read the following section of his book in which he writes, the women appear to have very large lip rings. I bought an ivory one, which in size and shape was exactly like the rings for putting tablecloth napkins in. Sorry, table napkins in. The poor have bits of reed or calabash only. The lady would loth to part with it, but the sight of the cloth, cloth prevailed. This is a record which tells an even more pressured story of acquisition. And in this instance, it's hard to see Livingston disassociate himself from his actions as he coerces a woman to remove an object from her body for a reason it's hard to fathom. Livingston himself mentions the woman's reluctance in giving him the lip ring. By the way, nowhere does he address whether or not she was pleased with the terms of the exchange. And I'm left wondering at the dynamics or the forces that came into play. When Livingston sent his daughter the lip ring, it became a gift from a parent to a child and a memento of a father's journey far from home. 53 years later, its state has changed again when it was put on display at the 1913 ex exhibition at the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh to commemorate the centenary of the birth of David Livingston. The lip ring, along with other objects, was loaned by Agnes's son to the Royal Scottish Museum for the exhibition. And a catalogue published in conjunction with the exhibition helps us see that the lift ring is offered as part of the presentation of, quote, a vivid picture of Livingston. The expedition catalogue is really interesting because it helps us connect fragments of information scattered in various sources, each one pointing at some small detail, some bit of knowledge about the lip ring that at least Livingston and, and two women may have called their own. We continue to do this in the museum. We start with objects and then we start to look for disparate sources of information about them, which we can layer together in an almost palimpsestic way to begin to find and pay attention to the individuals we have previously signed -lined. We also work to situate cross-cultural encounters in a personal, by which I mean a motive space, as part of the display of individuals' belongings in our collection. I cannot reiterate enough the importance of understanding the lived experience of people involved in these events as a way to give back agency to all those who are embedded in an object's history. A single lip ring can combined with a desire to think about its original creators, owners, and wearers, leads us to fragments and leads us to think more specifically about the jewelry within the context of personal adornment, coercive pressure, dismissive colonial arrogance, and aggressive fiscal incentivization. Incentivization. To me now, the unique ID that we hold in the museum is revealed as much more complex, rich, and thick with possibilities. As I come to the end of my time, I talk to you finally about Truth by Charles Orville Pinkington Jackson. Uh, this is one of eight panels made of reinforced cement, each standing around two and a half feet high. The models that we have were a joint venture between Pilkington Jackson and Mears, the architect of the museum itself. When the museum was built, they actually knocked together four one room houses to build and use the bed recesses to put the images in. The idea for the reliefs came from mainland Europe, but it was decided they needed to be plainer in style to reflect the simplicity, poverty, and essentially working classness of Lanarkshire in which we are based, which always sticks in my cross somewhat. Truth, the one that we are currently looking at, was the first relief created, and it was on the back of this that the other seven were commissioned. It was estimated that each would cost £150 to make. It was decided that the committee for the memorial would approach multiple societies which had a link with Livington to support each relief, such as the London Missionary Society, the Congregational Churches and the Anti-Slavery Society. Kama, the leader of the Bamawato or Nungwato, one of the eight principal Swana chieftaincies in Botswana, was also approached about sponsoring one of the items. He did, and actually, the Nunguato um, subscribed above the required amount. But this relief was taken from them when the Scottish Baptist churches kicked up a stink about not being invited to sponsor a relief. In a rare turn of fate, this turned out to be better for the Nunguato sponsored piece of art, and they instead sponsored the incredibly beautiful oak sculpture by Pilkington Jackson that we hold in our second to last gallery called The Last Journey. 
Truth and trust are key to the objects which have moved many miles from their origin and hold multiple meanings within them. We as curators often have to trust the information we are given, such, the, such as the story of the saucer belonging to Mary, or that the comb that we mentioned was given willingly. And we do, but our work is iterative and can rarely be defined as complete. We must continue to find the stories of these people behind these beautifully and rich, culturally valuable objects in our collection. For in these objects is a wealth of narratives, not lost, but waiting to be unmuted. Thank you very much for lending me your ears this evening. We open in the museum again for the season on the 9th of March, seven days a week, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. I will be happy to answer any of your questions here, and you will also be more than welcome to come and see all these objects in situ in the museum itself. Thank you very much. Thank you.